So tomorrow the Southern Ontario Open kicks off. I still have to work 2 p.m. till 12.30 a.m. I slept like total crap last night. I keep spacing on things I need to do to get ready and to bring and such like that. I'm expecting a shit show. Hello everyone, my name of course is Artemis and welcome to day 6 of Vita, vlog every day of April, where I'm going a little more into my background on gaming and the causes I'm involved with. Today we're talking about the game that replaced Warhammer for me, being War Machine and Hordes. Technically two games, I guess. Now, I first learned about War Machine and Hordes around 2007, 8, 9, somewhere in there, I'm not sure. Uh, I simply learned that it existed, I did not know much about it. When I got the chance to actually talk to somebody about it, it was basically presented as, oh, it's kind of like Warhammer, though it's different. Helpful. But I was given the idea that it was a less expensive game than Warhammer, so while I was working a full-time job that was 11 to 15 hours a week, I thought I'd look into it. Seeing the models priced at my local game store were pretty much the same as the Warhammer models, I will do. Even though in the end, yes, it would have been less expensive because at the time it was still a skirmish game, not a full army game, but I digress. Now when I got the opportunity to look at it in depth, what really got me interested was the world itself. The Iron Kingdoms is a steampunk-influenced high fantasy world, the Iron Kingdoms being the world in which War Machine and Hordes take place. On the western side of the continent, you had the Iron Kingdoms themselves, which consisted of Signar, Cador, the Protectorate of Menoth, Ord, Lael, Crix, Ios, a couple others I'm sure I'm forgetting. Whereas on the eastern side of this continent, where the game primarily takes place, you had less developed nations, ones that were more savage, such as the Druids of the Circle of Boros, you had the Trollkin people, you had the Scorn Empire, and of course the Legion of Everblood. Now what really drew me into this game was the fact that the mechanics were so simple, where it was basically 2d6 plus stat versus opponent stat, and the game was very well balanced, like I was impressed. Yes, as things got introduced, you found new ways to be exploitative, you found things that were overpowered because they weren't tested in a certain way, things like that as you will when you're adding new content to any game. So for a brief while there, you might see certain factions really rise to the top. Mostly they seem to stay on top because that's what more people were playing. The aesthetics of the models were really well done too, like they were very detailed models. They're 32mm scale, so slightly bigger than the Warhammer ones, they're more complex in detail. Whereas, you take a look at your typical line trooper in a Warhammer 40k army, where it's just pretty much an armored suit sort of thing with a couple of minor decorations, with the forces in War Machine and Hordes, they were wearing, like, a lot of gear. You had their undercoats, their jackets, their vests, their belts, their tabards, their everything else. Let me tell you though, my whole not liking painting but liking having painted models did not appreciate that portion. Now the reason I really appreciate the level of balance these games have is because the armies do have incredibly distinct playstyles and powers. Now granted, the overall table rules of various powers were the same between factions, so if I had a telekinesis spell and you had a telekinesis spell, they both worked the same way. I more mean each had their area where they really excelled. Signar, the faction that mostly drew my interest, was lightning themed in terms of their power source and very heavy on ranged combat and typical knights. Whereas Kador was more like the USSR, where it was heavy armor and lots of dudes. Then we had the Legion of Everblight, which were very much a glass cannon and you were relying heavily on a few units to get work done. But because you had all these little ones to just throw out there, they could just soak up hits for you. Before when they were balancing things, it was mostly just the way certain rules were written on the stat cards. With Mark III, they opened it up to be able to change anything because they were relying more on the War Room app than they were on the stat cards anymore. Now Mark III did have a very rocky start, especially for certain factions, primarily Scorn, who was not given proper treatment at the time. They were incredibly weak. But to the company's credit, they admitted it, and they saw to changing that. Now unfortunately we're coming to the part where the game has primarily lost me. During Mark II, at the very least, I'm not sure about Mark I because it wasn't around for that, each Warcaster had its theme forces, where you restricted the kinds of units you could take, but you got little bonuses, such as maybe this unit that you could, or attachment that you can only take one of, you can now take unlimited of, provided you have the right conditions to meet it if it's an attachment. 
or enough points to pay for it in general. Maybe your heavy war beast got a plus two to their speed stat. Maybe you got a plus one to your die roll to the side at the beginning of the game. Little things like that, they weren't game breaking but they made a cool little difference. Now Mark III theme forces saw a bit of a change. Now the overall idea I wasn't against because they were no longer Warcaster specific. However, what they have done though is made it so the only way to play competitively is to play theme forces. How'd they do this? By giving you free points. The conditions typically are take X amount of units or points worth of this kind of troop get Y attachment or solo for free. This can easily change your 75 point list to mid 90s. That's a huge swing. It doesn't matter that you're leaving a blind spot in what your army can do, especially in a competitive environment, because you're typically playing two lists, so you can build around that blind spot against something else. And at the same time, it's not worth giving up those extra free points. More bodies on the table means more than less bodies doing their specific jobs. It comes down to this version of Theme Machine is not what I wanted to play. It seems more like they're trying to keep a certain balance going by only having the balance for certain conditions. And while I can understand that is going to make their job infinitely easier, that's not the game that I signed on to play. It's actually sadly to the point where if things don't change within the next 8 months or so, I'm probably going to be looking at getting out of the game entirely. And I have not got a small collection of models. I have something from just about every faction. Also, I'd like to mention as a general caveat, I don't know how the community is overall. I can only really speak on our Hamilton community, which is extremely competitive. Now when I say extremely competitive, I mean it's basically unfriendly to any new players. It is not uncommon for someone new to the game to go put their models down and bottom of turn 1, top of turn 2, lose the game. And I understand that might be a thing if you're really new to the game and you think a tournament is the first place that you should go because you want to see high level play in action. You're not going to see it in action because you're not going to see play. Everyone's going to expect you to know what your army does as well as what their army does because they already know that themselves. Now there are a couple of great guys in our community who aren't that cutthroat. The two I'd like to make specific mention of are Ian Pongray, the last uh, press ganger that we had locally and Tim Banky, who was a former press ganger, uh, I think he gave that up before press gangers were taken away because I believe he now works indirectly for Privateer Press. He absolutely works for Black Knight Games, he runs the Arcane Assist podcast slash YouTube channel, and both these guys want to give people the fun time. They're not going to go easy on you, but particularly in Tim's case for example, we were playing a game where I was just relearning my circle of Boros faction going into Mark III, and I committed to a certain action that played out very poorly and probably wouldn't have played out much better. And I said, okay, you've seen what that does now and why that probably wasn't a good call and you probably should have done this instead as you were thinking and you voc vocalized to me. Do you want to take that back and see how that plays out? And it's like when I said the other day when it came to Warhammer. People like that in miniature gaming communities, especially miniature gaming communities, are tantamount to the survival of a games community. Try and be one of those people. What about you? Do you have any experience with War Machine or Hordes? Did you give up after Mark II was introduced? Were you part of the Mark II development beta? Do you hate Mark III? Did you like what Mark III brought to the table? Where do you stand on the machine? Talk to me about it down below. So thanks so much for joining me on this day of beta. Uh, this is being released the day of the Southern Ontario Open kicking off, where I will now be at least headed to by the time this goes live. And so for the next three days, you're probably going to see Southern Ontario Open related vlogs, where I will be running a couple of tables in Infinity with Dan Bullock once again, and Brandy will be there painting with us. And I'll be going around doing some brief interviews, I'll get some shots with the organizers, things like that. And I'm bringing a couple of bottles of Sword of Leash. So I hope to see at least a few of you at the Southern Ontario Open later today, as well as the rest of the weekend. But until then, take care of yourselves and each other, and I'll talk to you soon.
quick for that. 